Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. Patsy Bolton Wright was a beautiful, vibrant, and wealthy woman who seemed to have everything going for her. She was part owner of a famous wax museum in Grand Prairie, Texas. She raised and showed horses. She was a popular socialite, a vivacious woman who seemingly had no enemies. Her death in 1987 was shocking. Patsy often took a cap full of NyQuil to help her get to sleep, but around 3 a.m. she called her sister, telling her something was wrong. She couldn't breathe. Patsy had been poisoned with strychnine. It was found in the NyQuil bottle beside her bed. And though police initially suspected suicide, it became clear that Patsy Wright was not suicidal. In fact, she was embarking on a new life. Years of investigations, sifting through red herrings, a messy divorce, and family secrets would not turn up her killer, though there are credible suspects. Welcome to Episode 56, Poisoning Patsy. Grand Prairie, Texas is just to the east of Arlington, between Dallas and Fort Worth. It was established by Alexander McRae Deckman in 1863. He had been living in Birdville, later named Haltom City, and learned he could trade his wagon and oxen for land in Dallas County. So he bought up about 240 acres of land in what is now downtown Grand Prairie, naming the town after himself. He granted right-of-way to the TMP Railroad in 1867, and in July of 1876, the tracks were extended from Deckman to Fort Worth. TMP Railroad caused a bit of confusion by referring to the tracks going from Fort Worth to Dallas as Grand Prairie because of its location on the eastern edge of the vast prairie that stretched into West Texas. When a post office was established in 1877, Things became even more confusing, as the postmaster misspelled Deckman, and the common name for the area on maps had been Grand Prairie since the 1850s. The inconsistencies with the name caused issues with mail delivery for locals and businesses, especially once Grand Prairie Independent School District was established in 1902. The post office officially changed the destination of Deckman to Grand Prairie, and when the town was incorporated in 1909, the name was also changed to Grand Prairie. Downtown was bustling with a dry goods and grocery store, a cotton gin, two blacksmiths, a drugstore, hotel, lumber yard, barber shop, and even a short order stand that sold barbecue and cold drinks. In 1929, the Curtis Wright Flying Service opened near the neighborhood of Dalworth, kicking off Grand Prairie's rich history of aviation. The town suffered through the Great Depression like the rest of the country, and in 1931, Clyde Barrow and Ray Hamilton robbed the inner urban ticket office in downtown Grand Prairie. That would be Clyde of Bonnie and Clyde. When World War II began in 1939, the War Department granted permission for the Navy to use Hensley Field, rechristened as the Naval Reserve Aviation Base. Much of the early 20th century was marked by growth as the Vault Aircraft Facility provided many jobs to residents. Aircraft and defense manufacturers continue to dominate the city's economy today. But in 1972, Grand Prairie would become famous for becoming the new home to the Southwestern Historical Wax Museum. Originally located in Dallas's Fair Park, the museum began its remarkable history when a Clay County deputy sheriff, along with two other well-to-do citizens, began collecting historic firearms. The sheriff had dealings with many outlaws as Clay County's northernmost border sits on the Oklahoma line. Partner Henry Harrison Schwind developed relationships with lawmen, and as his hobby became more well-known, he was able to collect firearms from legendary lawmen from the Texas Rangers to the U.S. Marshals. In 1957, W. Thomas Bolton purchased the collection of weapons, and he had become enamored with wax sculptures of famous people after visiting Madame Tussaud's Wax Museum in London. And there, an idea was born. Securing loans with other partners and investors, Bolton opened the Southwestern Historical Wax Museum in Dallas in 1963. 
His idea was to highlight the unique collection with replicas of the famous and infamous historic figures of the Old West and soon more recent Texan history. The Wax Museum was a huge success, and as the owners struggled to keep up with the crowds, they decided to move it to a larger location in Grand Prairie. By the time it reopened in 1972, the guns and wax figures of the likes of Pancho Villa, Wild Bill Hickok, and Billy the Kid were joined by recreations of scenes like the assassination of JFK in Dallas. Warren Beatty donated the car used in the film Bonnie and Clyde to the exhibit at the museum, and wax figures of Beatty and Faye Dunaway as Bonnie also went up. The museum drew in more than 250,000 guests a year. Not long after the museum moved to Grand Prairie, Tom Bolton's daughters, Sally Horning and Patricia Bolton Wright, became co-owners. And by then, it was worth a few million dollars. At this time, I'm going to pause for a quick commercial break. The only children of Tom and Virginia Bolton, Sally and Patsy Bolton, grew up in the Park Cities, attending Hillcrest High School. While Virginia was a traditional housewife, Tom was an oil man, successful with an innate passion for Texas history. In the early 70s, Mr. Bolton and his new wife and his daughters, Sally and Patsy, all moved to the Arlington area. Sally had attended Texas Tech for two years and then taken business school courses. Patsy was considered a head-turner, an effervescent blonde, beautiful, with a lust for life. And as successful as she was as a businesswoman, her passion was really horses. But she and Sally did a great job running the museum, though there was some jealousy and sibling rivalry. Patsy was good-looking, and men buzzed around her like flies. She lived the life of a Dallas socialite, attending charity galas, parties, and opening nights. She had entree to almost any social event. She loved riding around town in her red Porsche or Lincoln Town car. After college, Patsy had married a man named Bill Wright in January of 1965, seven years before she and her sister took over the museum. Bill was an executive for a department store chain and, unfortunately, a workaholic. The couple lived in Arlington and did well there for a while. They had two kids, Leslie and Wayne, and were happy for many years. When Tom Bolton died in 1976, the sisters found themselves in a court battle over their inheritance with their stepmother. Patsy and Sally won the suit, becoming controlling owners of their father's prized museum. But the nasty court battle had taught Patsy a lesson. She vowed that her children would never have to fight for what was rightfully theirs. Patsy and Bill divorced in October of 1980, and it was very amicable. She got the house, the ranch, and three saddle horses. Bill got the Cadillac, an 18-foot boat, and most of the home furnishings. Bill moved to Houston and remarried. But when he passed away in 2005, he was laid to rest next to Patsy. And later, to her family's surprise, they found out she had named him executor of her will. In January of 1981, Patsy met a man named Bob Cox when he called the museum, asking her and Sally if they would be interested in buying his wax museum, which featured all the American presidents. Cox was a high-rolling poker player, and he owned his rival museum with his wife, Kitty. Bob Cox wanted out of the museum business and out of his marriage. He and Kitty were separated, and though negotiations to sell the museum fell through, He still asked Patsy out. She told him to call her when his divorce was final. And he did. They began dating several months later with Patsy believing he was now single. He was 14 years older than her, came with his own glitzy social circle and country club, and treated Patsy like a queen. But when she found out he was actually still married, she pressured him to divorce Kitty. They took a trip to Galveston in January of 1983, where Cox had plans for a new wax museum near the seawall. There were already sets, figures and costumes, and other stock for the museum, just sitting in a derelict building. Cox wanted to renovate and restore the building, planning on opening it in time for the tourist season. 
But on February 1st, the old building caught fire, destroying much of the museum collection. Two days later, Bob and Kitty Cox's divorce was finalized, and in April of 1983, Bob and Patsy married in Dallas. Patsy would later tell friends and family that literally on her wedding day, Bob Cox changed. He was no longer the charming gentleman she knew. Now he was verbally abusive to her and her kids. Though Bob had agreed to live in Arlington with Patsy until her kids graduated from high school, he resented it. Making matters worse, Bob didn't contribute to the marital finances at all. Patsy paid for everything, the house, the utilities, groceries. She soon discovered that he spent most afternoons at the Dallas Country Club playing poker. Patsy knew he had been a gambler, but didn't know what a problem it was. Kitty Cox cited his gambling addiction in her divorce petition, fearful that his addiction would bankrupt the family. But the true end of Patsy's second marriage was when the IRS came calling. They were trying to attach her earnings to Bob Cox's tax debts, which amounted to about $300,000. She had been smart to get a prenuptial agreement, but later told friends that Cox tried to sue to have it voided. Kitty Cox would characterize her ex-husband as a sociopath to Patsy, advising her to get out of the marriage as soon as she could. Bob moved out one day before their first anniversary, and a week later, Patsy filed for divorce in April of 1984. But Bob did everything he could to avoid being served the papers. This went on for about two months. Just a month after that, Patsy filed for a restraining order, saying that Bob was harassing and stalking her. He claimed it was because he was afraid she would get his country club membership in the divorce, which was ridiculous. Patsy had no interest in the country club. She had plenty of social standing in her own right. She just wanted out of the marriage with her assets intact. Patsy's friends later said that Bob Cox had started following her around, parking outside of her house at night, and even wearing disguises. Sally Bolton also had one divorce behind her and remarried to a man named Steve Horning in 1981. Evidently, there were tensions between her sister Patsy and her new husband. Sally had met Steve when his landscaping company did some work for the museum. Steve was several years younger than Sally, but to friends, it did seem like a love match. Patsy was initially thrilled for her sister, but her opinion of Steve changed pretty quickly. Her friends would later say that Patsy called Steve a phony and that she detested him. Steve had dreams of being a rancher and a big game hunter, and Patsy was dismayed when just a few years into the Horning marriage, she found out her brother-in-law had spent all of Sally's inheritance. In June of 1987, she made strides to make sure Steve Horning would never end up owning any of her assets. The sisters had originally planned on a buy-sell agreement. They each had $500,000 life insurance policies. If one died, the other sister would buy out her shares of stock in the museum so that one Bolton sister would remain as primary stockholder. They had signed this agreement in June of 1985, but in the two years since, a few things had happened that made Patsy uneasy about the deal. First, the museum's stock value had gone up substantially and the sisters had recently bought a new museum in San Antonio and were planning a Ripley's Believe It or Not, a collection of oddities and curiosities. Then, in the fall of 1985, Sally was diagnosed with cancer. She and Steve had been having marital problems before she was diagnosed, but Steve remained very supportive of his wife during her illness. Patsy knew that her parents and two of their grandparents had died of cancer and that Sally's prognosis was not great. If Sally died with the original buy-sell agreement in place, Steve would inherit half a million dollars. And though she appreciated Steve's attentiveness to her sister, Patsy didn't trust him. Sally underwent chemotherapy, and by the summer of 1986, she was in full remission. But she now agreed with Patsy that their initial agreement should be changed. The sisters scheduled a board meeting in early November to discuss the new agreement. But Patsy Wright wouldn't live to attend that meeting. I'm going to pause now to hear a word from today's sponsors. Okay. 
A few months before Patsy Wright's death, she won a cutting horse contest at the Mesquite Rodeo. She was also in the process of buying a 30-acre ranch in Aledo, where she could keep the horse named Dry Leo and another three-year-old gelding she owned. She had sold the home she shared with Bob Cox about three months prior to this and was renting a house until she could move to the ranch. On Thursday morning of October 22, 1987, she was working with a horse trainer. She was determined to ride Dry Leo in more competitions. It took guts and great athleticism, but Patsy felt up to the challenge. Between her inheritance and her salary at the museum, Patsy was a millionaire. And while she lived the socialite life, her dream was to raise horses, show, and compete. She had paid $26,000 for Dry Leo and had high hopes for him. That same morning, she put $1,500 down on a mare she planned to breed. Her dreams were coming true. She would soon be living in the country with her horses while maintaining her duties at the museum. Several friends worried about her living alone in a rural area. Though she laughed off concerns, she did buy a Glock automatic pistol. She was happily busy renovating her new house and growing her stable. On the evening of October 22nd, Patsy hosted a cocktail party to kick off the 1987 Halloween tours at the museum, where wax figures and actors dressed in ghoulish costumes. It was a dress rehearsal, and she considered it the most important event of the year. The dress rehearsal party was a huge success, and Patsy headed home, tired but cheerful. She got home around 9 p.m. and made several calls. Her son, Wayne Wright, later said when he talked to her, she sounded more than fine. In fact, she sounded great. She had fixed herself some scrambled eggs and gotten into her pajamas before she crawled into her king-size waterbed. But sleep didn't come. She was probably still keyed up from the party, so she took a dose of NyQuil. She often took a capful to help her sleep, a fact known to her friends and family. She had discovered it was useful when her babies were teething and started using it fairly regularly herself. Patsy thought of it as a cure-all, and one friend teased her about being a NyQuil head. But shortly before 3 a.m., Patsy called her sister Sally. She told her in a faint voice, I've taken some NyQuil and something's really, really wrong. I'm having trouble breathing. Sally called the police, but couldn't remember the address to Patsy's rental house, so she and Steve jumped in their car and raced over there. It was just a few miles away. The front door was locked, and Sally remembered that Patsy said her spare key had recently gone missing. Steve went to the side of the house and crawled in Patsy's bedroom window that was cracked open for the cool breeze. Steve said it looked as though she were passed out on the bed. He ran and let Sally in the front door, and they noticed that Patsy's alarm system hadn't been set. She had the system installed after she found several broken windows, and also with the restraining order on her ex-husband in mind. Nothing was stolen, though she had many valuables in the house. But it gave her the creeps. But for some reason, the alarm was not set that night. Steve and Sally said that Patsy's eyes were opened, but unfocused. They tried to get her up, but couldn't. They called 911 and soon firemen and paramedics arrived. Later, a paramedic on scene said it had already been too late. Patsy had no pulse, no blood pressure, and her eyes were beginning to dilate. But they rushed her in an ambulance to Arlington Memorial Hospital, where at 4.15 a.m., she was officially declared dead. The ER doctor had no idea what happened to Patsy and an autopsy was performed by the Tarrant County Medical Examiner. But they found nothing. At least nothing obvious that would have killed this seemingly healthy, vibrant 43-year-old woman. Steve had told police that he tried to administer CPR on his sister-in-law, and that when he blew in her mouth, green fluid would come into his, and he would spit it out. And even though foul play wasn't suspected at the time, a quick-thinking patrolman picked up the bottle of NyQuil and put it in an evidence bag. As her shocked family grieved and made funeral arrangements, her daughter Leslie received a strange call the day after her mother's death. She said the female caller asked to speak to her mother, and when she told her that her mother had passed away, the woman had said, Well, good. I wanted her dead. She thought at the time it might be a cruel prank, but later the call would seem more nefarious. 
Sergeant Jay Gustafson of the Arlington Police Department was assigned to the case on Monday morning, less than three days after Patsy Wright's death. His supervisor tossed the folder on his desk and said, Gus, there's something not right here. Gustafson was a young homicide detective, but he knew in his gut as soon as he read half the report that this was a suspicious death. There was no suicide note, no drug use except for the -the over-the-counter NyQuil, and a healthy 43-year-old woman didn't just die with no apparent cause of death. Though there were no signs of forced entry, Steve Horning had told police he had moved a table with two plates on it out of his way to get to Patsy when he tried CPR. This detail didn't make sense, especially in light of Patsy's conversation with her son. She was specific about being alone and making herself some eggs before she went to bed. But Gustafson trusted his gut, and he sent Patsy's blood and tissue samples off for tests. When the Tarrant County Medical Examiner called him, he asked him if he was sitting down. It's strychnine, he said, and the poison would not have shown up on a normal toxicology panel done by the M.E. Gustafson then remembered the NyQuil bottle in evidence and had it tested. Sure enough, it tested positive for strychnine. Actually, it contained eight times the dosage that would normally kill a human being. Strychnine has often been called the lover's poison, but that is a misleading nickname. It is an extremely painful and horrifying way to die. Your muscles start twitching. Then you start feeling like you're suffocating before going into massive convulsions. Your head and feet bend backwards. Your face turns blue. And your mouth twists into a grotesque grin. Between each convulsion, you suffer a period of waiting, knowing another one is coming. The dread and helplessness felt would be terrifying. After three or four convulsions, death will finally come caused by paralysis of the respiratory muscles. And Patsy Wright had been killed with a pure form of the poison. One form of the poison, which would be about 3% strychnine, is used to kill gophers, rats, and other pests. Patsy's dose could only be bought legally through chemical manufacturers to authorized buyers. It's why as a poison, strychnine is rarely seen in homicides. A day after the strychnine was discovered, Gustafson and a panel of experts, including the FBI and a representative from the Vicks Corporation, which manufactures NyQuil, held a meeting. No other cases of poisoning had been attributed to the lot number on Patsy's NyQuil bottle. When the FBI ruled out product tampering, the case went back to Gustafson as an isolated attack. A homicide. However, the Tarrant County M.E. ruled her cause of death undetermined, as neither suicide nor homicide could be completely ruled out. But friends and family were adamant that Patsy Wright would not have killed herself. The manager at the museum said, quote, Patsy would never take her own life. She loved life. She was outgoing, happy, independent. She could knock you off your feet with enthusiasm. Her children also vehemently denied it was suicide. Leslie Wright said, quote, There's no way it was suicide. She had everything to live for. She had a good business and a good life. She was entering the competitions with her horses. She was very happy. None of the family feels like she could have committed suicide. She was a very up, positive type person. Considering how painful a death Patsy suffered, investigators agreed, but they had to prove it. The Tarrant County Medical Examiner ordered a psychological autopsy of Patsy Wright. The psychologist interviewed Patsy's family and friends to determine her state of mind at the time of her death. The doctor found that Patsy was a low risk for suicide. She was under no financial strain, she was in excellent health, and she was actively planning her future. She even had her alarm clock set for the next morning. She fit none of the criteria for suicide. This validated everything Detective Gustafson believed. He felt that the murder was personal. Strychnine is an agonizing death. This looked like vengeance to him, especially considering the large dose in the bottle, enough to kill eight or nine people. So he started looking at motive and opportunity. He said, quote, Money is a good motive. So is revenge, love, hate. Sometimes it's just anger, retaliation. Who stands to gain by her demise? Who stands to lose if she doesn't die? 
and the killer would have to know her well enough to know about her NyQuil habit. This all pointed to someone she knew, someone who was close to her. Investigators started uncovering things in Patsy's personal life that were at odds with the cheerful face she showed the public. Family drama and a strained relationship with her ex-husband, for starters. Gustafson noted that this wasn't necessarily a crime of urgency. If the killer knew Patsy's habits, he or she just had to wait until she needed that little cup of NyQuil to help her sleep. Maybe they knew of her hectic schedule that day, but maybe it had been put in earlier. But he also felt that there were other clues to suggest that she wasn't alone that night. All the lights were on, and the TV was on, and if Steve Horning was to be believed, there were two plates set up near her bed. It is possible she just didn't mention a late-night visitor to her son when they spoke. One person surprised Gustafson by naming himself as a suspect, Steve Horning. He and Sally had been wrangling with Patsy's adult children about their inheritance. Leslie and Wayne Wright wanted the Hornings to adhere to the new agreement that Patsy and Sally had been planning to draw up. They wanted their mother's stock rather than the money. Sally had refused, telling them they were too young, and also pointing out that the stock was worth way more than it had been when the original agreement had been signed. This seems rather cold to me, but family dynamics can be really bizarre and they certainly wouldn't be the first family to squabble over a large inheritance. For his part, Steve insisted that he and Sally were setting up, quote, ironclad wills that will give them the museums upon our deaths. But, if Sally died before Steve, he would own a controlling share in the museum, the exact thing that Patsy had been trying to prevent. With the investigation going nowhere, things were about to get even more strange. Just 11 months after Patsy's death, on September 9, 1988, the Grand Prairie Wax Museum was destroyed by fire. It was initially thought to have been caused by an electrical short. The 39,000-square-foot museum, the more than 300 wax figures, and priceless artifacts and antiques were all completely destroyed. The total damage was estimated to be about $8 million. Rumors circulated that the fire was set to destroy evidence of Patsy's murder. Though the faulty electrical box was originally blamed, the fire marshal insisted that it was arson. Quote, In a matter of minutes, the whole building was involved. That just does not happen. And yet, the investigation about came to a standstill when the original case file disappeared from a locked room at the Grand Prairie Fire Department. While the marshal scrambled to put an inquest together, there were thefts from the wreckage. Sifting through ash and debris, Thieves were able to make off with the extensive gun collection, something that wouldn't have melted or burned as easily as the rest of the museum. To this day, descendants of the original owner of the firearms, Henry Harrison Schwind, continue to search for the guns. They have recovered about 100 out of the 300 that went missing. Arson investigators believed most of the thieves were just looking for souvenirs. But there was one arrest made two weeks after the fire. A 23-year-old mortuary student named Stanley Lester Pointer was arrested for removing an item from the rubble. But a Dallas grand jury reduced the charge to criminal trespass. The site of the old museum was leveled, and 18 months later, the Wax Museum of the Southwest reopened as the Palace of Wax. It was a one-story building painted pink, lavender, and gold, styled with Arabian influences. A Ripley's Believe It or Not exhibit was included. Sally Horning was well aware of the rumors in the community about Patsy's death and the fire. The intrigue of the murder and the fire only helped to boost revenue for the new museum. So she and Steve hired an attorney as a legal consultant to help with the investigation into Patsy's death. Patsy's ex-husband, Bill Wright, had been as surprised as her family to learn he was executor of her estate. He had been questioned and took a polygraph and cleared. He now joined with his children, Leslie and Wayne, in hiring a private investigator to work the case. Famed P.I. William Deere came on board. He touted himself as a modern James Bond, solving cases the police had given up on. But journalists considered him basically an ambulance chaser. He liked to insert himself in high-profile cases. And to be fair, he wrote a book called O.J. is Innocent and I Can Prove It 
I think his dubious reputation was earned. After the fire, Detective Gustafson received a tip about another woman who died mysteriously who had worked for the museum in the early 80s. Lori Ann Williams was head secretary when in September of 1984, she left work with severe abdominal pain. An appendectomy was performed, but doctors were stumped when they found the organ to be healthy. And Lori continued to get worse, dying 11 days later. Her death was officially ruled as the result of viral pneumonia as a complication to surgery. Gustafson asked the medical examiner to review Lori's files, but he didn't find anything consistent with strychnine poisoning. But relatives, who had already been suspicious, now wanted answers. They raised the $750 necessary to exhume her body. It was almost two years after the death of Patsy Wright. Private investigator Bill Deere took soil samples around Lori's grave so that there would be no question of herbicides or pesticides causing any poison that might be found in Lori's system. But ultimately, the autopsy showed no findings of poison. Bill Deere pointed out that the poison could have metabolized before her death, but there was just no proof that Lori had been murdered. Still, he insists that Patsy had stumbled onto something she wasn't supposed to see at the museum. He said, quote, I think Lori Williams was murdered to scare Patsy Wright to death. Even the police chief seemed to agree that the Wax Museum was a common link in all areas of investigation, though he also mentioned drug trafficking, gun running, and even the smuggling of illegal aliens. But I ask you to consider Patsy's life. She had a good job with controlling shares in a lucrative business her father had built. She had just bought a ranch and was absorbed with buying horses and training them for competition. It may sound naive, but I don't think she would have been involved in any kind of illegal activities. She didn't need to. She was rich enough. But the specter Bill Deere made of her stumbling onto illegal activity at the museum stayed in the rumors that swirled around the fire and her murder. And soon, friends and family started pointing fingers at each other. Even Leslie and Wayne Wright, her kids, who were students at Texas Tech, were questioned and polygraphed. They did stand to inherit quite a fortune, but they were cleared right away. Patsy also had a new boyfriend at the time named Larry Todd, but he had an alibi. He was one of the phone calls she had made the night of her death. He had been in Austin. And by all accounts, he was devastated by Patsy's murder. Investigators then honed in on the couple who were boarding Patsy's horses as she waited to move to the ranch. Bill and Bonnie Alexander had cashed a $4,000 check Patsy wrote the day before her death. The problem was, handwriting experts showed that while Patsy had written the word saddle in the notes, she hadn't actually filled in the amount. One of the Alexanders did that and also added in the word fees next to saddle. On the day Patsy died, she had called her accountant and asked him to liquidate some assets in order to have the $125,000 in cash which she had needed to close on her Aledo ranch, which she had moved up by two weeks. The accountant specifically asked her if there were any other large outstanding checks to cover, and Patsy had said no. Maybe $4,000 did not seem large to Patsy, but it looked fishy to investigators and her accountant. Then it came out that Patsy's expensive horses were actually still in the Alexander's name. She had bought them from the Alexander's and paid for their boarding. And she had even spent a month in June living with them until she found her rental house. But Bonnie Alexander explained to police that Patsy simply gave them a check and told them to add up what she owed them for several months of boarding and entry fees to competitions. Bonnie also explained the reason the horses were still in her and her husband's names. Patsy didn't want her brother-in-law to get his hands on them if anything happened to her. Steve Horning had already made himself suspicious to police, and there was certainly family drama happening. She and her sister were set to have a meeting in two weeks after her death to work out a new financial agreement. P.I. Bill Deere thought that the Alexanders might have had another reason. Jealousy. He suggested that Bill might have been rejected by Patsy, and in turn, Bonnie might have been jealous of her. Could they have poisoned Patsy? Bill Deere did find that strychnine was sometimes used by horse breeders in very small doses to treat their animals. He asked the Alexanders to take polygraph tests, and they did and passed. 
It's an interesting theory, and that check business certainly sounds shady. But it also sounds like they were really Patsy's friends. She had lived with them for a month. She boarded her horses there. She trained with Bill Alexander. It's quite possible she did hand them a blank check. That $4,000 would not have put a dent in her fortune, even if her accountant wasn't aware of it. And naturally, even without Steve calling himself a suspect, Sally and Steve Horning were definitely on Detective Gustafson's radar as well as Bill Deere's. Police and paramedics did not remember that table that Steve claimed he moved, the table that had held two plates. They also doubted his statement that any liquid came from Patsy's mouth. One paramedic on scene said nobody successfully performed CPR on this woman, meaning even if he had tried mouth-to-mouth, it was too late. She didn't regurgitate anything, and there was no evidence of it at the scene. Steve Horning also had a record. In 1970, he was arrested and charged with assaulting a woman. Investigators weren't sure if Patsy knew about this, but she had already had a friend run a background check on Steve when all of their financial drama started, so she probably did know. But Steve and Sally Horning fully cooperated with the investigation by the police and with a private investigator. Steve actually took two polygraphs. While the first was inconclusive, he passed the second. Obviously, these tests are inadmissible in court, but it is an interesting footnote in the case. Detective Gustafson also received an anonymous call several months into the investigation. The caller was a man who said, Did you know that Leo Fikes dated Linda Donahue? Linda Donahue was a 41-year-old woman found murdered in her apartment in Arlington in June of 1987, just five months before Patsy's death. She had been stabbed and strangled. And why is this important? Leo Fikes and Patsy dated for a short time before she dumped him seven or eight months before her death. Fikes was a student at Southern Methodist University where he took chemistry, and Gustafson found that he made a purchase in the summer of 1987 from the only store that sells strychnine in Dallas. Fikes had actually met Patsy before her marriage to Bob Cox. Once they divorced, he sought her out again in 1984. She had broken up with him then because he kept seeing other people, but they rekindled their romance in the spring of 1987. This time, Patsy ended the relationship when he pressured her to get married. She had been through two divorces and had no interest in remarrying. He admitted to Gustafson that he had been devastated and even said, I was wondering when you were going to get to me when the detective called him. Like those before him, Leo Fikes passed a polygraph and it came out that the company he bought chemical from sold products for sanitizing services, not strychnine. It was not on the receipt. Furthermore, Fikes was never really investigated for Linda Donahue's murder as they had only been on a few dates. Eighteen years later, a man named Roger Eugene Frayne Jr. was identified by DNA. He was already in prison for a similar murder. So investigators had hit another dead end but Gustafson had one suspect he liked for Patsy's murder, her ex-husband, Bob Cox. Several of her friends and family had given statements about Cox. And then, of course, there was the restraining order that Patsy had taken out. She told friends he followed her, watched her, and had threatened to ruin her. He was actually the reason why she installed the security system on the rental house, an expense usually not bothered with for a short-term rental. Even more interesting... When they divorced, Bob didn't have many assets and had five pending lawsuits with former business associates. He didn't stand to gain anything from Patsy's estate, but revenge damn sure couldn't be ruled out. And his predatory behavior in stalking her was definitely cause for concern. But it was all circumstantial. And remember that fire in Galveston at the wax museum he had wanted Patsy to buy? He sued Hartford Lloyd's insurance company for denying his claim. He had said that hobos had set the fire, but the insurance company alleged that Cox himself had started the fire to collect on the insurance money. He had been unable to talk his wife into buying the dilapidated museum. Actually, she had offered him $14,000, but insulted, he declined. It was insured for $300,000. Oddly, this didn't damper their relationship at the time but Patsy had actually given a deposition to Hartford during his civil suit. 
She talked to them about 10 times in 1986 and 1987, discussing the value of the property. As she had had it appraised, she was in a position to hurt her ex-husband's lawsuit. Evidently, Patsy also knew that one of the most valuable pieces in the museum had been moved to Bob's office in Garland, Texas, before the fire. Patsy was scheduled to testify in the lawsuit in November of 1987, just 10 days after her death. And Bob Cox won his lawsuit. Though Hartford had been able to prove that not all of the valuable items were destroyed, they couldn't prove that he actually set the fire. He was awarded $1.3 million. Maybe Bob Cox wasn't willing to risk his ex-wife, a credible and upstanding citizen, to take the stand against him. Patsy Wright was not just a socialite. She was a respected businesswoman in the same business of museums as her ex-husband. Her testimony could have lost him the trial. And there's more. Bob Cox all but refused to be questioned about his ex-wife's death. Reportedly just saying, quote, I met her, I married her, I divorced her. He also refused to take a polygraph. The only other suspect in the murder of Patsy Bolton Wright was that student, Stanley Lester Pointer, the guy who was arrested for stealing souvenirs from the ruins of the Southwest Wax Museum. Interestingly, the item he was caught with was a financial ledger for the company. Private investigator Bill Deere found this very suspicious, as he would have passed up thousands of dollars worth of artifacts to get that ledger off of a shelf. Deere alleged that Pointer was looking for blackmail materials. But Stanley Pointer was shot to death by a policeman on April 13, 1991. He had struck the officer who was on the side of the road writing a ticket. The officer bounced off the front of his car and landed on the hood. Pointer started swerving the car, trying to throw the officer off, but the policeman hung on and shot Pointer six times through the windshield. And Stanley Pointer didn't run just because he had clipped the officer. He had two felony warrants out in connection with another arson case at Our Lady's Youth Center in December of 1990. That's quite a coincidence. Could there have been a connection between Cox and Pointer? Someone set that Galveston fire, even if it couldn't be proven. And someone most certainly set fire to the Southwest Wax Museum. No one has ever been arrested in the murder of Patsy Wright. And it doesn't look like anyone ever will be. This twisty case has it all with shady family members, the horse trainers and their forged check, a mysterious fire, and a vengeful ex-husband. Sally Horning said of her sister, quote, She was a beautiful, sophisticated, and intelligent woman who went out of her way to make everyone feel comfortable. People respected her and thought a lot about her. She had no enemies. Sally Horning was right about her sister in the first part. By all accounts, Patsy Bolton Wright was a remarkable woman. But she was wrong about her enemies. The list of people who could profit, directly or indirectly, from Patsy's death is dizzying. And sometimes, the simplest answer is the right one. I think Bob Cox, her ex-husband, would be the most likely suspect. And he had the trifecta of motives. Love, money, or revenge. Southern Fried True Crime is written and produced by me, Erica Kelly. The original graphic art is by Coley Horner, and Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio. I owe a huge thank you to Erica and Vince from the Gone Cold podcast for their research on this case, which they generously shared with me. They are committed to bringing light to forgotten Texas cold cases and wanted Patsy's case to get as much attention as possible. If you have any information about the murder of Patricia Bolton Wright, please contact Arlington Police Department Cold Cases at 817-459-5772 or Tarrant County Crime Stoppers by calling 817-469-8477. And thank you to everyone who came to CrimeCon. It was an amazing event this year, and I had so much fun meeting you guys. If you weren't able to attend, check out my social media to catch up. I also visited the site of the Upstairs Lounge Fire and the Zaconati Murder House while I was in New Orleans and took lots of photos. Also, many apologies for my raspy voice this week, listeners. I lost it at CrimeCon and still haven't
haven't fully recovered. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on most large platforms like Stitcher and other podcatchers. If you're interested in supporting the show, please visit my website, southernfriedtruecrime.com. There you can sign up to be a patron of the show, make a one-time donation, or purchase show merchandise. That's southernfriedtruecrime.com. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.